Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. So much history that people would be excited to know, but don't. This could be a hot spot for these shows that end up going to Broadway. This announcement means St. Louis has become a more global city. Today on Spotlight, St. Louis connects to the world with new nonstop flights to Frankfurt, Germany. Plus, honoring Memorial Day by remembering a local battle that many haven't heard of. And then over 100 period artifacts and new pieces of artwork are on display in St. Charles County. But first, a pre-Broadway world premiere taking place right here in St. Louis. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. On this cold winter day, auditions are being held for what may be Broadway's next hot ticket. Our first person is coming into the room now. But these auditions are not being held on Broadway. Sometimes I wonder if my mom and dad can hear me. For this show, Broadway has come to St. Louis. Go, 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 you gotta take a chance to make something happen. Don't the Karate Kid the movie has been turned into the Karate Kid the musical. I didn't choose to be the new kid. It is the first show of the season at Stages St. Louis, and more important, the first time ever a Broadway show has staged its pre-Broadway tryout in St. Louis. This is one of the biggest pieces of entertainment news in the, in the history of St. Louis theater. St. Louis was chosen for the show's tryout run after Stages St. Louis's executive producer, Jack Lane, told the producer of The Karate Kid about Kirkwood's brand new state-of-the-art Performing Arts Center. Hi, New York. Those regional callback auditions were held at Stages St. Louis's headquarters in Chesterfield, with producers from Stages watching in person, while the director and his team watched over the internet from New York. If I could take his pain away. Of the 11 actors who auditioned in St. Louis, seven were cast. I got it including Luis Pablo Garcia, a 19-year-old Webster University theater student who won the role of the Karate Kid's friend, Freddy Fernandez. It's crazy. It's insane. Honestly, this is my first professional show. Yeah, so it's wild. Thank you. Thank you, Okay, so we're taking it from the top. The final sprint to take the show from the page to the stage began in Chesterfield six weeks before opening night. In all, there will be 40 St. Louis performances to help producers figure out if any changes are needed to make sure the show is Broadway ready. Broadway audiences are by and large tourists and Karate Kid is a perfect show for that. And so I think this is a great barometer for us to see what an audience will be like in New York because these are the people we're trying to please. Wax off, wax off. There is that pressure to carry the torch and, and honor what the fans have fallen in love with. Um, but there's a freedom and a, and a playfulness to creating a new piece of theater. Amon Miyamoto, considered the top stage director in Japan, is directing The Karate Kid. The choreography, which alternates between delicate and explosive, has been created by the husband and wife team of Keone and Mari Madrid. The show's pop rock score has been written by Drew Gasparini, who also wrote the lyrics. The book of the show is written by Robert Mark Kamen, who wrote the screenplay for the original Karate Kid movie, based on his own experience as a bullied teenager who found solace through karate, thanks to a real life Mr. Miyagi. The picture that you see, the possibilities of probing into the emotional lives of these characters is, is multiplied by having song. By having dance and movement and choreography, is the physicality has expanded. And so I'm watching a whole fresh new take 
on my 40 year old thing. Tony Award nominee Kate Baldwin is playing the Karate Kid's mother. You can never recover from humiliation. Broadway veteran Alan H. Green portrays the sadistic karate instructor John Kreese. Pay to fence. Canadian actor and director Giovanni Sai is playing Mr. Miyagi. And John Cardoza, an up-and-coming Broadway performer, plays the Karate Kid. It's very fast and furious, and so we have to be very careful about the placement of every limb at every moment. Um, and But there's a lot of trust in the company. You know, you spend a lot of time drilling these scenes until it is so, so inside of you that, you know, you just feel confident. Some of the cast has been able to spend what little free time they have seeing the sights. But what seems to impress them the most about their time in St. Louis is how working in a quiet Midwestern suburb has proved the Gateway City is a great place for a new Broadway show to put down roots. This could be a hot spot for these shows that end up going to Broadway. It's not just San Diego, Seattle, and Atlanta anymore. No, 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 no. This is really cool for St. Louis as much as it is for us. The world premiere of The Karate Kid the Musical runs through June 26th at the Kirkwood Performing Arts Center. Visit stagesstlouis.org for tickets and more information. HEC celebrates St. Louis like no other media outlet, highlighting those making a difference through science and technology. It's a wonderful community of young entrepreneurs who are all doing very amazing things. Focusing on arts and education. Poverty is not going to stop a student from getting a quality education. We can't let that happen. Broadcasting meetings and functions to educate and inform our community. St. Louis feels like a city on the road to extraordinary things. Producing compelling documentaries celebrating our region. Henry Shaw founded the Missouri Botanical Garden, one of the first of its kind in the country and one of the best of its kind in the world. Visit agcmedia.org for up-to-date, locally produced stories about the people and organizations who make St. Louis great. On June 1st, for the first time in nearly two decades, St. Louis will once again have non-stop passenger airline service to the European continent. We're thrilled to be in St. Louis. Uh, and the great state of Missouri for this very uh, exciting event. Uh, our commitment to all of you is that we will work tirelessly uh, to make that a success. We are also thrilled by the positive feedback of the business community. Also very, very important for us to have that foundation to work with and to build on. The connections that we offer is not just between St. Louis and Frankfurt, St. Louis and Germany, uh, but really St. Louis and the world. An incentive package put together by the business group Greater St. Louis Inc. St. Louis County and Lambert Airport convinced Lufthansa, Germany's largest carrier, to offer three flights a week to Frankfurt for the next two years. Greater St. Louis Inc. CEO Jason Hall tells HEC President Dennis Riggs this is very important for the future of our region. This announcement means St. Louis has become a more global city. It allows us to bring more jobs, exchange in culture, and more investment. You know, if we're going to be better in the future than we were in the past, we've got to become more and more global. This is connecting us to markets throughout the world, nonstop service to Europe, the first flight in almost 20 years. St. Louis is winning again. Greater St. Louis Inc. founder Andrew Taylor, the executive chairman of Enterprise Holdings, tells Dennis the group made a crucial difference. There is a, quite a number of teammates that played a part in this. I think that one really important new element was Greater St. Louis, which is where business is speaking with one voice. And the five organizations that went into Greater St. Louis added their resources. So we had you know, a single point of contact of where, along with the, our other partners, where we could make this as easy as possible for Lufthansa. Taylor believes the economic impact could be enormous. I think a direct flight to Europe is just if you look at other cities that have them, they talk about lots of financial benefits. You know, there still is a, I think, a very positive effect when people can see each other in person. 
and deals can be made and, and ideas can be exchanged and you, you don't know what new is going to happen, but there's uh, been some conversation recently that it's 100 to $150 million a year for a direct flight to Europe in additional business in an economy in the U.S. Jason Hall says in addition to businesses, the flights have generated a lot of attention from individuals. While this flight is a huge win for economic development in a more globally uh, connected and, and dynamic metro, one of the things that struck me as we were announcing this flight was the number of families that reached out to me and said, I want to thank you for what you've done. And the word that kept coming up was life changing. This flight is life changing because I have family in this country or I have family in that country. We had representatives here today from the Bosnian community and what this does to be able to increase connectivity uh, is extraordinary. So I think it's important to remember the impact of today's win is going to be felt on a personal level by the internationally connected families that we have here in this metro. It's going to make it easier for them to enjoy coming out of COVID, that personal connectivity with their families that have been has been under strain. And I think let's not lose sight of that either. That's a big win for the families of St. Louis. For Andy Taylor and his family, the commitment to a stronger St. Louis runs deep. I just feel personally that it's, you know, been such a privilege for me. It's still very fun and we love St. Louis. St. Louis is where my father started his business and St. Louisans welcomed his business and it was a big part of his success and you know we just think it's a time right now where we can put some more resources back into St. Louis and make it better. And that'll make us happy. HEC will be the exclusive television media on the flight. You can watch our coverage at hecmedia.org and we'll have a comprehensive report on Spotlight, June 26th. The story of Jefferson Barracks, later on Spotlight. From Bush Stadium in downtown St. Louis, welcome to Cardinals baseball as the Cardinals play the second game of a four-game series against the Los Angeles Dodgers. The Dodgers St. Louis is a baseball town. Smith, court 20 to right down the line. With a long history of epic victories. But on May 26th, 1780, the site of this ball field was the center of a battlefield. And what took place in St. Louis that afternoon reshaped the future of the city and possibly the entire American West. And it all happened in less time than it takes to play a baseball game. Well, I think most people, when you first say the Battle of St. Louis, think it must have been an American Civil War battle. They come up to me afterwards and say, I never heard of this before. Probably one of the most significant and underrated battles of the entire American Revolution. It was the first of only two Revolutionary War battles fought west of the Mississippi, with a legacy that has rippled across two and a half centuries of American history. The Battle of St. Louis is one of the reasons why Ohio, Illinois, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan are now part of the United States rather than Canada. People just don't know about it. And then when they hear about it, they refuse to believe it. Certainly never learned about it in school and went to school here in St. Louis, grade school and high school and college. Never remember hearing about it at any of that. The vast majority of the books written about the American Revolution are written by authors Princeton, Harvard, Yale, Maryland, Virginia. Gee, I see a pattern there. It's East Coast snobbery. In St. Louis, a few reminders of the battle still exist, but not many. The only genuine relic that survives is the church bell used to warn the town it was coming under attack. For a long time, the story of the battle itself was under attack. In the late 19th century, there were historians who denied that it had ever happened. And then the evidence turned up that it, in fact it had happened, and it turned out to be a much bigger story than anybody had anticipated. Now, a pair of history detectives is trying to fill in the rest of the blanks, looking for clues buried in ancient documents written in three languages, hidden on two continents. 
It's a completely different set of stories that are just fascinating and that we're still learning about. The attack on St. Louis was led by the British, but they recruited Native Americans to do most of the fighting. They knew they had to pick a side. Some of it was trying to make calculated decisions in a way that wouldn't get too many of them killed. The Battle of St. Louis is a story of keen foresight, vainglorious mistakes, redemption, high hopes, and false hopes. You have this group that's in bondage. They're listening to this. Liberty, freedom. It sounds really great. I want that too. The St. Louisans who came under attack that day were outnumbered three to one, but a surprise thunderous defense led to their unlikely victory. Oh, say can you see? If St. Louis's ragtag militia had lost the fight at this spot on that day, today, these St. Louisans might be standing for the singing of God Save the Queen at a cricket match instead of a baseball game. Between St. Louis and Los Angeles, the visiting team from Mexico. If the British had won the battle at St. Louis, the world would be a different place. Had St. Louis fallen, maybe we'd still be having tea at four o'clock with our pinky in the air. Watch the full HEC exclusive documentary, House of Thunder, at hecmedia.org. Then head out to the new American Revolutionary War Museum exhibit on display at the St. Charles County Heritage Museum. My name's Stephen L. Kling Jr. and I'm talking to you from the St. Charles County Heritage Museum in St. Peter's, Missouri. My small publishing company, THGC Publishing, entered into a partnership with St. Charles County to do a museum exhibit on the American Revolutionary War in the West. The idea here was that uh, a few years ago I wrote a book on the Battle of St. Louis and talked to a lot of people that wanted to know more that the Battle of St. Louis didn't happen in a vacuum and that there were actually events that went on up and down the entire Mississippi River throughout the war. So I gathered a group of authors from the U.S. and Spain and we wrote a book on the, called The American Revolutionary War in the West and this exhibit is based on that book. There was a great effort to combine period artifacts, uh, weapons and regalia and other things. Beautiful paintings uh, specially made for the exhibit and the book. We have a number of copies of documents. We received permission from the Archivo in Seville, Spain that people have never published before. And beautiful costumed and uniformed mannequins. I worked real closely with Stephen Kling with a lot of research. We went by uh, photographs, we went by actual paintings and uh, early drawings of the period. From there, I started creating these uniforms. Um, my day generally began as early as 2.30 in the morning, and I would work all the way until about 6.30 at night, and this is what I did for almost three years. Most of them are wool because that was the chief fabric of the time. Um, one in particular, uh, Bernardo Galvez, his uniform took seven months to embroider. Two leaves on that uniform take an hour. Two sets of bars on that uniform takes an hour. So that kind of gives you an idea. Well, it was a great effort to not only talk about the battles, which of course are part of the history, but we really wanted to focus on the people that were involved in it. In the 18th century, St. Louis and St. Charles were really closely connected. People such as Louis Blanchet, the French-Canadian man who founded St. Charles, he was at the Battle of St. Louis. The Midwest and the Mississippi River Valley has broad connections to even the early eras of American history. So often, Missouri basically gets covered from about 1820 to 1821 for the Missouri Compromise. Um, other than that, though, it usually kind of gets passed over. And so when people come through here, we really want them to understand how their community came to be and how this community developed. We want them to also understand the role we had in some of the less comfortable topics of history. So we want people to understand our place in this broad narrative of American history. 
What we hope people will learn from the exhibit is, uh, one, what happened out here and led to the Louisiana Purchase and other things that helped make our country, but more importantly, to learn about the experiences people went through and that the history was broader. There was a very diverse group of people in many respects more diverse than what was going on in the 13 colonies. And there are important stories to be told, and we do tell a number of those stories. The great part about the museum exhibit, it's free and it's open to the public. On display at the St. Louis County Heritage Museum. Exhibit info can be found on Facebook at Steve Kling BOS. For more videos highlighting our region's history for your homeschool and classroom learner, check out our educational website, educate.today. Use the keyword St. Louis History. First person, real world, expert driven. That's the focus of the videos, lesson plans, and activity ideas you'll find at our educational website, educate.today. When I came to work here, uh, I found that most everybody, if you said Jefferson Barracks, it was a cemetery. Jefferson Barracks was originally 1,702 acres given to the United States government. The name came about because Thomas Jefferson, a lot of people, certainly Confederates, like to say Jefferson Davis. And this was his first duty station after he graduated from West Point in 1828, but uh, it was named for Thomas Jefferson. It opened in June of 1826. It was a good deal for everybody because the government got a a place with lots of wood here, limestone, which was quarried 50 yards from here, and a waterway, which was the main highway. It became the first infantry school of practice, a uh, very nice way of saying boot camp. Jefferson Barracks sent troops out, and they fought in every war that the United States was involved in. Between the Black Hawk War in 1832, up through Actually, National Guard troops went out to Afghanistan. So it's an important post, and it's very important because of all the equipment and material and men that transfer through here. Westward expansion really emanates from where you're standing. Everything the U.S. Army was using was shipping from here to points west. Uh, for example, the 6th Infantry Regiment is going to ship from here. Uh, the 1st Missouri Volunteers are going to ship from here. The brand new regiment of Dragoons, they're going to leave from here. In fact, the brand new regiment of Dragoons is organized and raised here. In many regards, Jefferson Barracks is the birthplace of American cavalry. Uh, another important point in the uh, history of Jefferson Barracks is the, our role in the creation of Buffalo Soldiers. There were some integrated units in the Continental Army during the American Revolution, but for the most part, the United States Army is segregated. We don't have troops of African-American origin until uh, the time of the American Civil War, when they're serving in uh, volunteer formations known as U.S. Colored Troops. After the war, it's decided to create four regiments of African-American troops, two of cavalry, two of infantry. Three of those regiments, uh, the 24th Infantry and the 9th and 10th Cavalry, were organized here at Jefferson Barracks. Uh, the 9th and 10th Cavalry, of course, have got a uh, dramatic history. Uh, they're the ones really known as the Buffalo Soldiers. It was turned over to the medical department during the Civil War, so there were lots of people here. Uh, there were over 30,000 patients in Jefferson Barracks General Hospital during the Civil War. The Civil War Hospital stood till about 1902, and, and during the Second World War, there was the medical department had about 12,000 people working at Jefferson Barracks. One of the nurses' uh, barracks still stands over on Hancock. Going on with this theme of how things change, uh, we have the introduction of machine guns and the, uh, the 1895 Colt, which is here, a great example of an early machine gun that was used by the United States. Two of these get sent to Cuba during the Spanish-American War. Did the U.S. Army buy machine guns? No. Did Tiffany, you know, people you know Tiffany Lamps, Tiffany, uh, his son served in the first U.S. Volunteer Cavalry, and so the old man ponied up to buy a section of machine guns for the Cavalry Regiment, which was commanded by Leonard Wood. It's not just a story about young men, it's a story about young Americans. 
Women had uh, a role as well in Jefferson Barracks. There was uh, the Women's Auxiliary Corps were here. We had WAX, um, and as well as the Women's uh, Army Nursing Corps, which were, had a very significant uh, presence uh, at the post as well. The, the, U the U.S. Army Air Corps even had an auxiliary with uh, female pilots, the WASPs, who would uh, transport aircraft. Have you ever heard of Kathy Williams, who enlisted as William Cathay and was the only woman to be serve in the uh, Buffalo Soldier regiments, and she enlisted here at Jefferson Barracks. Some of the more obscure but still important, the first successful parachute jump from an airplane took place on the uh, parade ground at Jefferson Barracks in March of 1912. Albert Berry jumped, he was strapped to the struts of a biplane. He untied himself or unsnapped himself from the struts and he jumped. He said it was a very hard landing, but he was good. So much history that people would be excited to know, but don't. But in my estimation, as far as a continuously active post, Jefferson Barracks is probably, if not the most important, right up there in the top. My name is Bill Hershey. I am a professional Taps bugler. Taps is a just a soulful 24 notes, 24 beautiful notes, and I try to make every note just sound just beautiful. It's really an honor to play Taps to the veterans. In, in my opinion, when the family hears live Taps, I, I think it just brings emotion to the surface, and it's really the final farewell salute to their loved ones. Next week, the story of how a teacher with students labeled unteachable helped them all graduate, plus a program helping kids love learning by bringing it to life. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.